major exercise of uh, trying to figure out the Yukon Canada terrain here in the, in the Yukon. Uh, and uh, so it's part of that effort uh, that led me to go uh, do some mapping there in 2004, 2005. So that was the original mapping. Uh, one thing that struck me when I worked in there is, is uh, how juicy the rocks are. Uh, obviously there's of course gold in the area, but there's also uh, throughout the area there's quite a bit of uh, uh, sulfides, uh, generally pyrite, but sometimes something a little better. Uh, that's quite common in those rocks. So that, that sort of uh, spurred the idea to me that you know maybe we needed to do a little more than just mapping. Uh, as a result of that mapping in, the, uh, in 2005, I released an open file map. Uh, and this, the geology I'll be presenting today is more or less that uh, geology with some improvement based on the, the recent geophysics. Uh, so in 2016, uh, uh, a pot of money came together where we could afford to do a uh, VTEM plus survey of the area. Uh, the money we had is uh, uh, from the Canadian uh, Northern Economic Development Agency. Uh, it's a pot of money that's, that's called the Strategic Initiative for Northern Economic Development. Uh, so it's a matching fund uh, scenario from the federal government here in in Canada, uh, in which we were able to pull our budget with uh, that additional funding uh, to acquire a 200 meter uh, line spacing survey over Livingston Creek. So the image I'm showing here is basically the, uh, the, the total field mag uh, from that survey at 200 meter overlaying into a, a slightly uh, uh, lighter shade. The regional mag, which is in this in this region, is about 800 meter line spacing. Uh, so all of the the data uh, is is uh, was released as a set of two open files, uh, uh, both jointly released by IYGS and the GSC, and all of that is available for download uh, uh, either from our website or the GSC. Uh, so the area is an area that uh, has a lot of coarse plaster gold, but it's not got a long, long history or, or an active history of uh, our hard rock exploration. This is sort of the snapshot of the claim uh, blocks as of uh, about a year ago. Uh, and so the key thing is that the core area where all most of those claims are, are bounded by two major strikes of fault system, the Big Salmon Fault here on the west and the Davity Fault uh, on the east. And we'll come back to those structures a little longer, uh, a little later, sorry. Uh, currently, there is one group of claims in this area that uh, is seeing, has seen the last couple of years some active exploration by Yukon Nevada Zinc. Uh, they had a drilling program there this year, but no. Uh, uh, none of the results from that have been announced yet. Uh, just to the south of the, the map area, there's another group of claims that uh, has seen some interesting results in recent year. Uh, those are held by uh, strategic metals. Uh, they're just outside the survey area and uh, the area that I'll talk about uh, uh, for the geology. Uh, but uh, it, it looks like they, they, uh, they're drilling a, uh, an extension of the Big Salmon Fault. And uh, here's one of the grab results from some of their drilling intersection uh, last year where uh, they get some pretty interesting uh, silver values. <coughs> okay, so for the next few slides, I'll be focusing uh, a little bit on the geology and try to uh, uh, do a quick run through uh, <coughs> the main units in the area and highlight some of their potentials as we go. Uh, so the first thing, the Big Salmon Fault is the big uh, structure that, that essentially divides primarily the rocks of Quinellia to the, uh, to the southwest <coughs> and those are uh, a mix of Upper Paleozoic and uh, Triassic uh, mainly volcanic and some sedimentary rocks. Uh, and then the rocks that we'll be focusing on for the rest of the talk are going to be uh, the Yukon Tana terrain, which are northeast of the Big Salmon Fault. Uh, 
so the oldest units and what I've done, what I'll do over the next few slides is only turn on uh, the units that I'm talking about. So the oldest units are the snow cap assemblage and they're pre pre predominantly quartzite, cementic schist, uh, a little bit of graphitic phyllite and some subordinate uh, chloride schist and amphibolite uh, and a few uh, thin bands of marble mainly uh, near the big salmon fault. <coughs> Uh, the snow cap is intruded by uh, uh, Devonian to Mississippian uh, orthonices, uh, tonalite and ground diorite. Uh, a few of them were dated in the area here at about 350 to 3. This, this age is a bit anomalous and a bit old. Uh, not very good results, but 350 <coughs> to 360 is the right uh, range of age for these units. Uh, this is overlain by the, uh, the thinness of the assemblage, uh, which comprises uh, some greenstone units in this area here, and this lighter shade of green is uh, 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 probably uh, a mix of volcanic clastic and, and uh, my kit quartzite. <coughs> and these generally represent uh, arc assemblages. Uh, there's one uh, uh, fairly uh, uh, conspicuous greenstone marker unit associated with some ultramafic rocks uh, and gabbros, uh, which runs through the middle of the area. This one is, uh, unlike the other units, is not an arc package, but it's more of a mid-ocean ridge uh, basalt uh, package, and it's associated with minor carbonaceous and, uh, and as I mentioned, uh, locally prominent uh, ultramafic, the purple uh, units at this end. Uh, the ultramafic was of interest. Uh, last year, one of the prospector, local prospector here, uh, came back and, and actually had proven that uh, some of it uh, near some of the structure formed jade. Uh, and it's also uh, going to come back back of interest to us because it's uh, obviously it's an ultramafic, serpentinized ultramafic, uh, rich in magnetite, so it will be important in uh, uh, some of the interpretation of the <coughs> physics later. Uh, the other uh, uh, in, uh, important units in this thinness of the assemblage are uh, the graphitic carbonaceous graphitic phyllite and their association with marble. So we can see here on this photo, uh, the base, this black uh, phyllite uh, occupies a lower slope. It's overlain by uh, a marble. At the background here is the uh, Cretaceous granite. <coughs> uh, so the uh, ex exposure of graphitic rocks are shown in this darker orange uh, color in this area here. And of course, when we did the, uh, the VTEM survey, uh, graphitic lithology lit up uh, as, as very good conductor. <coughs> so here's a close-up of uh, some of the graphitic rocks that we find in the area. And all the uh, white areas are where we know from mapping uh, exposure of uh, graphitic rocks in, in the, uh, the map area. Uh, there's quite a big uh, conductor in uh, this area here. Uh, which is poorly exposed. We don't have uh, much outcrop, but there's about there's one outcrop right on this creek here, which is graphitic phyllite. So my bet would be that this whole wedge is probably also uh, in response to graphitic lithology. Uh, so the the problem with the graphitic lithology is that they will, uh, uh, as we saw on this previous slide here, they basically dominate the conductivity on some of these areas, but that doesn't mean that they're not prospective. <coughs> uh, uh, this area, this schist here, uh, had disseminated uh, uh, sulfides and uh, some quartz sulfide veins, uh, which some of which the numbers might be hard to read, but this is almost uh, 1,000 ppm copper, uh, over 3,000 ppm zinc. So, so some of them are uh, definitely anomalous for base metal. In that particular location, uh, there's a, a small greenstone lenses that are associated with this as well. And uh, the, there was a coincident, uh, I'm not showing this in this presentation here, but it's a coincident uh, mag and EM conductor and a mag high uh, that overlap at this location. Uh, 
this next photo here is a, a close-up of uh, uh, some malachite and uh, uh, some puritite in, in uh, the greenstone lenses that we see at that locality. Uh, continuing on with some of the geology, uh, moving into this area here, we uh, defend this an assemblage. The Mississippian rocks are dominated by uh, uh, what we call the Mendocina and Dicer Creek succession. So the, these uh, regions here, uh, where there again are significant graphitic fillites, some micaceous quartzites, and uh, some marble shown in this uh, blue here. Uh, in this area, there is, uh, so this is a zoom, let me just get back one side, so this is a, a zoom on uh, the conductivity on, on some of the VTAM results from this area here. Uh, and we can see that there are some strong, well-defined conductor that runs uh, northwest, northwesterly here. Uh, one of them, the uh, the westerly, the westernmost of these conductor uh, coincide with a map occurrence of a highly strained uh, greenstone unit uh, that had uh, disseminated pyrotite throughout it, uh, and uh, it looks like this this conductor is really mapping this unit well. There's another parallel conductor uh, just to the east of this one. Uh, and this triangle here is a mineral occurrence, uh, and that's going to be the next photo that we'll look at, uh, where we found a series of these uh, quite massive uh, veins. Uh, this case was uh, uh, loaded with galena, uh, and I don't have the results here, but it, they're obviously uh, showing, uh, I, I don't have the results on this slide, sorry, uh, but they are showing in all this uh, lead and uh, silver values. Uh, these are uh, remain to be properly prospected. So, but they're, uh, they're, they appear to have, have an expression in the uh, uh, the V10 results. Uh, the youngest stratified rock in the area is the, the Clinkett assemblage, uh, and the Clinkett assemblage is uh, only exposed in these uh, limited area here. Uh, it consists of the greenstone in green here, and the oranges are uh, quartzite and conglomerate units. Uh, so here's a, uh, a highly strained uh, quartzite of the uh, uh, Clinkett assemblage in this area. Uh, we could determine uh, that this was a younger unit because uh, we did some detrital zircon uh, analyses on, on some of the samples here and it contains detritus that are derived from these intrusive that we find in the area at about you know, 350 to 360 uh, million years. Uh, and the, uh, <coughs> uh, the greenstones typically are more alkalic uh, than other greenstones that we've seen in the area. Uh, so here are some shots of uh, uh, fairly highly strained uh, greenstone in this area here and some of the conglomerate units that we find on the other side of the Davide Fault. Uh, and then just to close in on some of the review of the uh, geological units, the youngest uh, Paleozoic unit that we find is uh, our uh, small discrete dikes. Uh, that are dating as Permian or per perhaps even early as Triassic in age. Uh, and so you can see here, we don't see the relationship, but uh, these dikes uh, cut an earlier fabric here in the uh, uh, quartzite semitic schist of the uh, uh, smoke app assemblage. Okay, so the uh, one of the obvious uh, number one uh, uh, benefit of having the detailed geophysics was to, uh, you know, test and improve our interpretation of the structure. Uh, it was sort of a, a, an interesting moment when I first got the results uh, uh, to overlay my, my geology over uh, the geophysics and find out that, the, you know, the, the mapping was actually fairly good. Uh, so it allowed me to uh, kind of 
locate more precisely some of the structures. It helped define, there's a structure here that was uh, ill-defined in the early mapping, but is, is quite obvious when you look at the, at the uh, geophysics. Uh, the geophysics also quite clearly uh, uh, outlines the change uh, between this north-south uh, Davity fault structure and the predominantly northwest uh, trends of structure structures in the Montana terrain. Uh, <clears throat> so all these rocks are highly strained, uh, so it's no surprising that uh, the, uh, the the magnetic fabric would be uh, uh, following this this dominant uh, structural grain. Uh, the deformation history in this block here, uh, most of the rocks are cooled uh, by about 190 to 195. I don't know if you can see the smaller uh, blue uh, text here are uh, argon, argon uh, mica cooling dates from the area. Uh, it is suspected, uh, as I mentioned, that some of the Permian dikes appear to cut an earlier fabric. It's suspected that some of the deformation predates uh, the Permo Triassic, so this is this would be originally the Klondike orogeny uh, that uh, the Luke Baranek and uh, uh, Jim Mortensen defined a few years ago, uh, and it, it really is corresponding to uh, the Sonoma orogeny that we uh, know of in uh, in Nevada, uh, and this is all cut by these later strike slip faults, the Davity fault, and uh, we presume the Big Salmon fault is not exposed anywhere, but we presume it's of the same generation as the Dabity. Uh, the Dabity is well exposed in, in the high land at the headwater of, of uh, the Livingston Creek area, uh, in which area we are able to see uh, a uh, ductile uh, overprinted by brittle deformation of a 96 million year old uh, granitic rocks, which is shown in, in this section here with clear dextral kinematics. So we know that uh, significant ductile deformation occurred at about 96 and possibly continued uh, uh, later on. Uh, so using the geophysics, I uh, basically kind of re, uh, refined the interpretation and that led to uh, releasing an updated uh, map, which is essentially the same interpretation of the geology, but with a much better, uh, much greater accuracy in the location of, uh, of the geological and, and fault contacts uh, on that. And that, that, that is available through uh, uh, our website uh, at, uh, as open file 2017-1. Okay, another exercise that we embarked in uh, in trying to uh, in get an enhanced interpretation of ge the geophysical results uh, was to look for uh, any kind of uh, uh, cross grain uh, uh, discontinuity or anomaly, uh, and this came uh, in the mapping, uh, and I I could I could go back to a geology map if you want later. Uh, but in the mapping, we recognize a series of northeast trending late brittle faults. Uh, one of them is shown here in outcrop. We, it's a very, fairly, fairly discrete uh, a fault plane, uh, generally uh, uh, either left or, or right lateral uh, displacement. They're probably mainly normal fault, maybe. Uh, and so we, we kind of interrogated the, the magnetic data and the EM data to find, uh, to see whether we could identify these kind of features in there. Uh, so uh, on the uh, left hand side, what, you, what we have is the resulting lineaments that we're, we were able to draw from this. And uh, if we focus on this area, uh, you can see some kinks and breaks in the, uh, uh, the magnetic data uh, in a number of places, and those are what we, we've tried to highlight. Uh, this is not a uh, very, uh, necessarily a very rigorous, it's a bit of a subjective analysis, uh, but uh, we try to have uh, not bias any particular area in the, in the map area when we did this. Uh, and it seems when we finish the exercise, it seems that there is a, uh, a, uh, 
cluster of these uh, these features, these breaks in the magnetics that seems to kind of uh, congregate more at the headwater of Livingston Creek, uh, the Livingston uh, Placer Camp. Uh, the green highlights here are areas that have been mined uh, uh, for Placer Gold uh, over the years. Uh, I should also mention that uh, I think that that will be a bit apparent in the next uh, slide, but I should mention that uh, there was already uh, the limited amount of work that was done around Livingston Creek about this area in here. Uh, had uh, suggested that there might be an upgrade in gold uh, uh, grades uh, in quartz, in some of the low quartz vein uh, as they approached these north northeast trending faults. Uh, so uh, anyway, this this is just something that is testable, or it could be tested by further exploration and, and looking for these kind of relationships. Uh, so the veins, uh, again, here I'm, I'm switching colors from slide to slide, uh, but the blue areas are areas that have seen uh, placer mining over uh, the years. Uh, the veins are shown by these box and line uh, orientation here. Uh, and so this is some of the field photos of some of the veins. This one is mostly just kind of preserved in the talus here, and here's the and now, <coughs> excuse me, an outcrop of one of the main cut by one of these late uh, brittle fault. I'm better geologist than prospector, so I have not found VG myself, but the VG has been, visible gold has been uh, uh, reported uh, from a number of these lanes uh, over the years. Okay, uh, when I look at this, uh, here we, we are looking at one of the band for the VTEM results. Uh, it's also intriguing that at the headwater of a lot of these placer creeks, we do find a very uh, definite conductor, very strong conductor uh, in the, in the VTEM data. Uh, so I kind of uh, focus a little bit on that. And uh, uh, it's, it's notable that uh, a, this conductor uh, is, uh, we can model it to be a steeply west dipping conductor which is uh, conformable with the, the lithological contact, the transposed lithological contact in the area. And it follows uh, the uh, west flank of this large Mississippian pluton that occupy the, the center of the uh, Livingston Creek area. Uh, in some earlier slide, I had a date of about 351, I believe, on, on this blue con here. Uh, now, the other piece of information that's interesting is that a lot of these placer operations uh, commonly report magnetite with the gold, as we can see in this pan uh, here. Uh, it's usually coarse magnetite, <coughs> and so it raised a question as to whether this conductor could be uh, related to uh, some SCARN uh, mineralization or formation of a contact aureole uh, at the time of intrusion of this pluton in Mississippi and time, and whether, whether that might be uh, one link to the gold mineralization in the area. Uh, that's an open question. Again, that's something that uh, could certainly be tested by uh, further exploration. <coughs> Another uh, uh, interesting uh, source, of potential source for uh, magnetite in the area would be ultramafic bodies that we find in this part of the area. Uh, again, uh, so this is showing some of the uh, prospective uh, placer ground in gray and red are the area that have seen mining. Uh, just, just for show, this is uh, uh, not an ATP, well, it's, it is atypical, but there's several nuggets of this kind of size that have been recovered in, in these creeks over the years. And I think as recently as a couple of years ago, somebody brought back in, uh, you know, a, a nugget the size of my hand. So, so uh, there's still quite a lot of coarse gold. Uh, and, you know, obviously this is an area that uh, is, is a real focus of, of the exploration in the area. Uh, so, uh, to come back to this, uh, so we report, we have seen, and we know that magnetite is abundant in the ultramafic rocks, uh, 
at the headwater of Livingston Creek, and so one could wonder if the source of the magnetite would be from there, and therefore maybe some of the gold as well. Uh, so that leads us to uh, look at, uh, uh, when, when we look at the mag for the first time, the ultramafic is just off the screen uh, in this area here, uh, but it was pretty obvious that uh, there's a, a, a magnetic train that more or less follows the, uh, the, the Livingston Valley today. Uh, but when we look at this more closely, we kind of notice that it's not perfectly aligned to the modern valley, but that there are some offset uh, uh, section, and that begs the question as to whether there could be some stranded uh, uh, paleo channels uh, that are now off the side of the valley and not in the main creek, uh, and those are possible, uh, you know, uh, target for further exploration for uh, placer uh, deposits. Okay, now jumping to uh, other uh, studies that we've done, and this was done for uh, pretty much the whole territory or everything that we could. Uh, uh, put our hands on the original sample. So, so we have an extensive uh, regional uh, geochemical stream survey, RGS, uh, for, the, for the Yukon. And using the same source of funding that uh, allowed us to do the, uh, the geophysics over the Livingston Creek, over the last several years we have uh, uh, systematically reanalyzed all the pulps that we could get our hands on. Uh, so that everything, so that now we have a uh, geochemical data set that is of, uh, of consistent quality for all of Yukon. Uh, and uh, we contracted CSA Global to do these uh, derivative product, weighted some uh, modeling. And so I'm showing here two models for uh, the Livingston Creek area for two of the gold models, epithermal and intrusion related gold. The key thing here is that obviously. Uh, all, all the catchments that are in the headwater of, of these uh, 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 placer producing stream show some anomalous value in terms of, uh, of their gold uh, potential. Uh, another uh, exercise that we did, though, that's like, what, 13 years ago now, uh, we did acquire a seismic survey along the Camel Highway, so that's quite a ways, uh, it's a, uh, about 120 kilometers north of uh, the area that we're focusing on. Uh, but it shows some <coughs> uh, interesting relationship, uh, particularly in the reinterpretation of that data uh, that was just published a few months ago by Andy Calvert. Uh, so we, uh, we're going to focus, we'll look at some of the seismic and focus here on the Big Salmon Fault. And the key thing is that the Big Salmon Fault comes out as one of the major uh, crustal structure uh, coming out of the reinterpretation of the survey that Andy uh, led. And this is published in the Canadian Journal of Earth Science. Uh, this came out sometime early summer, I think. So, so uh, it, it, it speaks well for the potential of being a major plumbing system uh, along the uh, Big Salmon Fault. Uh, this is looking at some of the, uh, the first vertical derivative regional data, and you can see that that structure is fairly well defined all along its length. Uh, and I'll just end this presentation here by focusing a little bit on the area around uh, Little Salmon Lake. You can see here there's good uh, topographic lineament defining this uh, structure. And we'll zoom in to uh, some areas near Little Salmon Lake uh, where, again, uh, this is some of this uh, weighted sum modeling by CSA Global. Uh, it might be hard to see at that scale, but we do see uh, some anomalous value for, uh, for gold in this, uh, in this uh, Livingston Creek area. And another area that kind of lights up in a similar way is uh, along the Big Salmon Fault near uh, the west end of Little Salmon Lake. Uh, there is a prospect in this area uh, that has seen some work, not in recent past to my knowledge, uh, and where there's some documented epithermal uh, gold mineralization associated with tertiary uh, volcanic rocks. Uh, so I think that, uh, that speaks well to the prospectivity of the Big Salmon Fault uh, and poss possibly its role in the mineralization at Livingston Creek. 
Uh, all the stuff uh, and more uh, that I've just talked about over the last half hour uh, were summarized in, uh, in a report that's in our uh, Yukon Exploration and Geology from uh, last year, from a year ago, in January. Uh, and you can find some of the details of what I've talked uh, about here. And uh, if there's any questions, if we can communicate back and forth, I would uh, happily answer your questions.